that's kind of my passion. I just want to help people progress because sales is not a dirty word. Sales is an honorable profession and uh, the people who do it right are those that want to help somebody else make a decision, not push them into making decisions. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do, but how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. All right, welcome back to another episode. Today's first guest is a talented sales trainer with more than 15 years of experience. She's passionate about helping salespeople overcome obstacles, co-author of the book, How to Sell Virtually, a sales trainer and coach at All the Small Stuff, Susie Matheson. Susie, great to have you. Thanks for having me. Yes. And today's second guest, we get to have two on and you'll see that they share something in common. He is a multi-award winning sales and marketing consultant, loves helping sellers succeed with a blend of insight, vision, and hands-on delivery co-author of the book, How to Sell Virtually, currently the sales director at Sales Marvel, Keith Rizal. Keith, good to have you as well. Good to be be on here. Thank you. Yes. And so right before this, I'll tell all of our guests, it's kind of fun. We talk about How to Sell Virtually, and this is a book that you've co-authored and wrote. And I have to laugh, right? A brand new puppy in the house. And we were talking, it brings us back to the beginning, right when kind of pandemic happened, we were all remote, we we're all working from home. And needlessly to say, we've all had this in our lives. You hit record or you jump on that Zoom meeting that is so important and chaos ensues. So we've made it two years, three years past the pandemic. We're kind of getting into now what we say is hybrid work in this hybrid environment. We're all on video. so. How do you sell virtually? And I know that's a big open-ended question, but I think the audience here is going to really be interested in some of the findings that you both uncovered in your book. So tell me how that all came to be and, uh, and, and how this, this book uh, started. I, I'll take that one if you want, Keith. Um, so I was approached by a company called BookBoon who said, hey, we're looking for some quick how-to guides for um, our customers um, to help them to really get to grips with um, how to sell virtually, how to improve their sales skills, et cetera, et cetera. And they basically asked me if I'd have um, or I'd consider writing a book on the topic of of how to sell virtually. Um, And I considered it and thought to myself, well, yeah, sure, I'll do this. But it's a bit lonely doing it by myself. So um, I had the great opportunity to uh, get Keith on board uh, and ask him to join me in the venture. And so Keith uh, agreed. I'm not too sure you knew what you were signing up to, Keith, did you, when you agreed? (laughs) But um, you agreed and uh, we spent uh, the next, so it feels like years, um, meeting virtually and getting the book written and finally published. I think we published it kind of, in spring this year, didn't we? So uh, yeah. it was it was a labor of love, but it was uh, a really good experience to go through. So that's how it came about. There was a, a need um, on the other end. People wanted tactical tips and we were hopefully able to give them some. That's amazing. And it's interesting at a time when we think of video and we think of getting on a Zoom as ah, no big deal, right? A, a, lot, of, a lot of companies have said, what's changed? What's different? But this medium, makes communication, especially the art of selling, very, very different. You know, one stat that we noticed was 58% of sellers feel less confident on video than they do face-to-face. So we know that, that selling is the, the art of you know, portraying and, and kind of passing over that confidence to our buyers, to our customers. What has changed virtually and, and what are some of the things that maybe if a seller's thinking to themselves, gosh, I, yeah, it feels harder. It feels tougher. I'm not getting the same traction. Why is that? Uh, Susie didn't know this at the time she asked me, but um, but actually, although pandemic COVID 
kind of threw us all into the same pot. We had to figure a way to keep you know, delivering for clients and all the rest of it. I've actually been selling um, video conferencing or telepresence. They'll shoot me if they find out I called it a video conferencing, but it's telepresence. So I don't know if you know Jack Bauer and the 24 series. Mm -hmm. When they used to go into the telepresence room, I've been selling that since uh, 08, 09. Um, and I had the great fortune of working for a, uh, a newsreader on the BBC, uh, an anchor, um, mm -hmm. uh, who t taught me how to master the art of you know, making it look like it's just a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you and with Tim or you and with Susie. Um, and and, and it's, it's just suspending disbelief uh, mm -hmm. that you're actually on a TV screen and making it as real as possible. We talk about a meeting experience. And so it's really interesting um, that we were all, literally all of us, uh, rich or poor, black or white, we were all thrown into this thing um, mm -hmm. where you couldn't travel. And we had to find a way to make it work. And so... Um, it was very fortuitous that, you know, Susie had this opportunity. She very kindly approached me. We, we, I mean, it was very hard. I can't deny it's very hard because all that stuff that was in my head, and I'm sure Susie had some of this as well, that you have to somehow tease out of your brain and onto a piece of paper, but a virtual paper at least. Uh, I found a, a, a really tough assignment, but I'm so pleased I went through it. Um, uh, because, because it actually helps you teach, you know, what we all now need to do. Um, and there are great stories, which I won't go into, and I'm sure Susie's got loads too, uh, where people, where this is now business as usual for organizations all over the world. And, um, and, and if I've if I feel like I'm, my batting average is off, if I feel like, man, I used to be in the room, I used to be able to read people, really connect and engage with buyers, it feels different in this virtual environment. It's probably never going back. What are some of the things your book uncovers that maybe our listeners can can start to think about or apply, maybe when they're prepping for their next uh, virtual call? I think one of the biggest challenges that people have online is keeping or winning the audience's attention. So um, you're in that presentation uh, style meeting, perhaps there's you and a colleague from your side, there's three or four people from the other side, and you're presenting your solution to them. And what typically happens in a virtual meeting is that people will lose attention, they lose attention far quicker than in a face to face meeting. So um, Rain Group did a study about this and they um, established that the attention span in a face-to-face -face meeting actually increases as the time goes along, whereas the attention span in a virtual meeting drops off and it drops off at a scale that you've lost everybody after three minutes. So basically, um, one of the top tips that we have is to think about how can you continue to keep that attention? So ultimately, every three minutes, you need to be changing it up. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you have to do a song and dance every time, but it's about dropping in a question, stopping to share the screen to get the uh, attention back and everybody focusing on your faces rather than the screen you're sharing. It's about um, handing over the mic to somebody else, changing the speaker. There's all sorts of things you can do. But um, that was one of the, the nuggets, I think, that, that we found um, when we were researching for this book. If you can change it up every three minutes, that's going to help keep attention in the room. And we know with with buyers that engagement leads to action. It leads to changing mindsets or, or actually consuming the information that we're all trying to share. So, Keith, I go back to you on you learn from a TV broadcaster. And I think that's something that very few people have really put two and two together, but it makes total sense. This is no different than kind of the nightly news, but more of a conversation. So I know you were going to jump in there and, and I want you to do so. I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. The, um, the, uh, and I'm, by the way, I, I you know, 
there are there are people that are good at this and there are news at 10 readers and they it's a bit i don't know what your golf game is but it's the difference between the rider cup and you know playing at your local pay and play or albeit playing fairly well i would hope but there there is a way to do this there is a way to hold people's attention susie went through some great points just then uh, i think over and above that um one of the key the really key things is um, is it, uh, and it's really tricky is that I have in front of me a screen as do you all, um, mm-hmm. but right here right now, Tim, you're you're kind of down there, and Susie's over here, and I've reconfigured my screen so that I'm down the bottom because I don't really need to see me. So mm-hmm. if I if I'm just looking at you now, you it doesn't look as though I'm looking at you now but i am seeing your image on my screen and that's the natural that's what feels natural um what doesn't feel natural is for me all of a sudden if i need to look you in the eye and land the point that i'm trying to make i have to look into this white speck of light which is my uh, my webcam um, yes. and all of a sudden i can just about see you in my peripheral vision down there uh, and Susie too. But actually, I, I need, in order to communicate and land my points successfully and, you know, prosecute the sale, which is what we're all after, mm-hmm. I, I have to raise my game. And that means I'm looking, I'm looking in the white dot. And that is weird. Um, it feels weird. Um, but it's, it's what you need to do. It's the new skills that we need to develop in order to make those points. It's so true. Making eye contact is almost, it sometimes seems impossible, right? We've all had the people, they look like this and you're thinking, wow, they really are intently listening, but are they even looking at what I, what is going on on the video screen? And for those listening, I was looking over to the side as if the camera was off on another monitor. We've all been in those situations. What are some ways you can optimize, not the tech and the tools, but what are some ways you can maybe optimize your desk space? One of the things we were talking about before we jumped on was virtual backgrounds. Yeah. And also all the oopsies and funny things that kind of come into a a video meeting at times just in the, in the course of life, especially now that a lot of us are, are in remote places. What? can you maybe recommend for background, foreground, setup of of different things? I'm thinking base level getting started, whether I'm an enablement leader that's looking to make sure I'm enabling their team, or I'm just that individual seller going, come on, I want to get my setup just dialed in so I don't have these problems. Okay. So just some top tips, the basics, first of all, is you want to be taking up about a third of your camera space, ideally in the middle. So um, the reason for that is so that the uh, other people on the call can see your uh, facial ex- expressions, they can see your eye movements, they can see your reactions to what they're saying, uh, albeit ever so slightly delayed, of course, because of the tech. But um, mm-hmm. that's really important is that you can be seen. So if you've got that floating head um, or you've got that kind of lovely view up your nostrils, we don't have it so much than we did three years ago, I have to say, thankfully. Um, ideally you want to be looking straight on into your camera and you want to be taking up about a third of the space, right? So that's the first thing I'd say. If you can't do anything else, that's the thing you can uh, adjust and you can um, influence. Um, If you want to talk about backgrounds a little bit, I personally think it's important to bring your personality um, and you can do that in various ways. You can choose a virtual background that reflects you Um, you can uh, put your own background up. So if you look at your background, Tim, I think you've been very purposeful about, if that's a word, purposeful. Uh Um, You've been very, um, yeah, you've you've put a poster behind yourself there. You've got a statement. So um, I can talk to you about that. I can ask you about that. Oh, what does that mean? Oh, I like that. I've also got one behind me that if I were to move, that you would see it in German. So it's not very good for today's podcast. Um, but basically says, just imagine the world was great and it was all your fault. Um, so, um, you know, just some kind of statement that, that, that shows what I believe in. Um, so a bit of your personality is cool. And if you 
if you're in a role, and, and I don't want to say do a blanket here because there are certain roles that probably require a lot of professionalism at all times and you cannot have any interruptions. But if you're not in one of those roles, I think it's actually great if the puppy comes in and disturbs you for a moment or the kids um, it, want to speak to mum or dad quickly because that shows you as a human. And ultimately, regardless of the medium we're using, people buy from people. And so if you can build trust with that person, you can share a bit of yourself. I think in most cases, that's going to be a benefit. I will hand over to Keith there. Yeah, um, thank you. Great segue. If, um, um, th that whole thing, because we're talking about backgrounds here, but actually I'm going to go back to meeting experience. Um, what, it can, what it must be is everyone knows we're on the screen. We know, but we're trying to minimize the gap, the delta between uh, an in-screen meeting, an on-screen meeting, and actually being in the same room, sharing a cup of coffee or whatever it happens to be. And the, the skilled communicator, you don't have to be in sales to be a skilled communicator, although it does help. Um, then uh, 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 they're going to be able to raise the difference. And it may not be anything I've said or Susie said or done, but the uh, the CEO or whomever it is that we're speaking to will say something like, do you know, that was a great meeting. I won't necessarily know why it was great, but you will be up there in the estimation compared to, shall we say, the average person that won't have taken time to take care of those details. Uh, and yes, of course, uh, it's lovely having the, you know, the pussycat or, uh, you know, the dog jump up on the uh, table. I have to remind people, by the way, if, if the kitty cat comes up on the table and is nuzzling you and whatever, that's lovely, but that's not the angle I've got. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Yeah. There is a, there is a perspective thing there, uh, which, uh, which you've confirmed. You are on a screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a good point indeed, yes. But you're right. It's about, and, and, and actually this gets onto a broader point, is it, yeah, are we in B2B or B2C? But actually I believe mm -hmm. post-pandemic we're in P2P, people to people. It's about humanity. Yes, we can see in, in, inside each other's homes, uh, and that's really interesting and intriguing. And so we're making ourselves just a little bit vulnerable um, and and that aids scientifically the, the building of trust and rapport. Um, but on, on, back to backgrounds again, I think as long as um, it's not distracting in some way, mm -hmm. because obviously we want people to concentrate on the message that we're trying to deliver or the outcome we're trying to achieve in the meeting. So uh, I, I, I happened to watch a politics program earlier on today, uh, and there was a uh, there's it's conference party conference season in the United Kingdom just now, um, and uh, there was a, a member of Parliament um, on on a screen with a whole bunch of receipts. Uh, they look like receipts, uh, paper receipts uh, right next to them, and it would take me and anyone else that's uh, politically interested right back to 2009 and the MPs expenses scandal uh, here in the UK. And that, so there's only a piece of paper, but it's a distraction. And I forgot about what the message that person was trying to land because I, it, it just made me laugh because, you know, and it's attention, that kind of attention to detail. Anyway, I've uh, been speaking too much, but I hope that gives uh, a 360 view on uh, sort of backgrounds and just taking a bit of care. It does. It does. It's all about creating that experience. And I think, Keith, what you did bring in is that you, you want to make sure that that has a uniqueness and, and something that catches your attention, but doesn't distract. It goes back to Susie's point. We have to keep our audience engaged. And one thing you said, I forget who it was. One of you said this in the uh, the call we had beforehand. It was, poke the other in the eye, I think was the direct quote. How are some tactics? We're in a meeting. I feel like I'm losing the attention of that audience. I, I loved the, the very tactical one of just take the slides and take them back off screen, right? Get back to the faces, get back to the people as a way to reset and kind of keep the conversation going. 
outside of that, what are some things you found in your book that really either captures somebody's attention as a presentation skill or as a way to maybe get those signals that, oop, I'm losing that audience and I need to bring them back? Thank you for that. Yeah, I, uh, and that's the message that you poke people in the eye. You're very specific, you're very articulate. Hopefully you've done your research beforehand and you know what the message is that you want to mm -hmm. deliver. So how do you make sure you've got that attention um, so that the, shall we say, the pathway, uh, the neural pathway is open? Uh, and I think it's um, having... Having knowing that you've got their total attention, and one of the ways you can do that is by asking a question um, that they have to respond to, um, and then the very next point is you're going to then poke them in the eye with your with your point because you know that they're open. Um, I, I grew up in as a, as an engineer, although uh, another story. And, and when computers are talking to each other, modems to modem. They actually have what they call a marker signal that says, are you ready to receive information? Uh, a and B uh, signals. And um, uh, unless the other machine says, yes, I'm ready to receive, receive information, nothing gets transmitted. Um, and I believe humans are quite similar. And that's why we say, how are you at the very start of our conversations or isn't the weather nice? I'm in Britain, which is, it's mandatory. You have to talk about the weather because we have, we have so much of it. Um, and, and but what you're really doing is you are, you are really saying, are you, are you ready to receive information? Because we, what you don't want to do is have the most important part at the very beginning of the sentence and they've not, They've not really been uh, open to receiving that information. You have to line it all up first. There's such a lot, such a lot to this. There really is. And actually, having been through the book process, it helped me crystallize as opposed to taking it from just intuitively what to do, how to respond, actually to getting that granularity of, um, of data, of process, and how it all works was really, really helpful. Because unless I can understand it, there's no way I'm going to be able to articulate it to someone else. So uh, anyway, that that that's just me. That that works for me. It works for me most of the time. Mm -hmm. How does that sound, Tim? I I like that. Just what you said, even right there. How does that sound, Tim? Right? It brings me back, and it, it's one of those markers that can kind of go. Yep. If he responded there, he's probably reengaged. Keith, I like what you did there. That was good. <laughs> Very nice. Now, Susie, I'm going to ask you, because I think this is also the point, and, and I've found this to be an experience that's it's good. If you have a large audience, large buying group, a lot of people don't necessarily get on video. We did a, a recent virtual sales report that was B2B buyers, especially enterprise buyers. And it amazed me. The one group that gets on video the least, because I don't think they want to either not be multitasking or be able to kind of get the read on them, is the C-suite. So when someone's a little hesitant to get on video, what are some ways we can do that without maybe crossing the bounds or upsetting the other side? So it's really interesting. Um, I have experienced this from the beginning of the pandemic all the way through to now. And I have to say that the acceptance of being on video now is a lot higher than it was at the beginning. At the beginning, it was really like pulling teeth to get people on camera. Um, mm -hmm. The technique that I tend to use is um, if I'm running the meeting um, and I've kind of I've got some kind of control of the meeting, I've got an, a lead role in that be that um, on the customer or on the salesperson side, I'll typically say something like, Tim, great to have you here. I can hear you. I can't see you yet. Uh, and just that little word tells you that my expectation is that you're going to come on camera at some point. Um, and it's it's kind of, I mean, you have to play this one a little bit by ear. You have to read the room, um, as we say. Uh, but sometimes you'll get reasons like, oh, yeah, no, I'm um, I'm driving at the moment. OK, there's no way mm -hmm. that I'm going to tell somebody who's driving to put their camera on because that's not really safe. Um, mm -hmm. So um, but what I might do, what it does give me the opportunity to do is to say, oh, it sounds like you're not really fully with with this 
at the moment, maybe you want to concentrate on driving. Should we reschedule? Now, I can't do that if I've got 20 people in the room. Mm -hmm. But if I've got one person or a small group of people, I might choose to do that. So look, this is a topic that I'm going to need your kind of feedback on. Let's reschedule for a time when you're in the office. And you kind of give that topic importance at that stage. Mm -hmm. um, if you believe that people are multitasking, um, then uh, the best way to do uh, to, to tackle that one, is, and they haven't come on camera for whatever reason, is to ask questions. Just keep them really engaged. Um, mm -hmm. And we've talked about that already. So um, let's imagine we've got Bob, the C-suite uh, representative, who's not there. It's like, um, you know, if you want to be kind to somebody, so um, I'm going to go through the figures now. And actually, Bob, I'd be really interested to know what you think after I've presented this bit. And that way, you're telling Bob that he needs to pay attention to the next few minutes. Otherwise, it's going to look a bit foolish. And nobody mm -hmm. wants to look or sound foolish on on a, on the video call. So that way, you're being kind to the person. Because if you just surprise them and, and you present for two minutes, and then you say, Bob, what did you think about that? And he wasn't listening. That's not good for anybody in the virtual room. So that's a little tip as well is to if you can't get them on camera, get them on board by giving them some heads up because you can't see what they're doing. You can't see if they're currently totally engrossed in what you're saying and loving it and lapping it up or if they're currently doing their expense report at the same time. So um, that's a little technique that I'd like to use um, if, I had, if I don't manage to get the person on camera. Keith, anything to throw in there as well? I think it's, uh, it's some great tactics, Susie. I love that you're kind of disarming the challenge without totally throwing them, uh, uh, you know, in that awkward position. Cause I think that's where a seller sits. I have to build trust and sell to this person. I can't, you know, it's not an internal meeting. I can't call them out. I've got to do it with some grace. And so, and so some great tactics there for our listeners. Yeah. Uh, really, really good point. Um, the, I think I, I try to test actually so much uh, we have rights even as salespeople i've got mm -hmm. to believe there's uh, a salesperson's bill of rights um somewhere that uh, we have the right to have uh, we're putting our time and, ma and materials and attention into this i want to make sure that because at the end of the day if you're in a competitive process you want to make sure you're not just there as column fodder making yeah. up the numbers right so uh -huh. if someone's not prepared to give me their full attention that worries me a little a little bit um and as susie said if someone's driving and it's unsafe to be on camera then i would challenge with a small c should we reschedule when i yeah because i deserve your full attention i i mm -hmm. believe and if they aren't going to give me their full attention for whatever reason that might be then that, that might cause me to believe it might cause me to behave in a certain way where i don't believe i'm going to get the deal and mm -hmm. uh I'm, I'm i might behave in a different way for whatever reason uh that might be but i would put the challenge out there and they might say you know keith you know i'm running around it's year end whatever it happens to be because life right yeah uh, you know, there's no way but i've made the point and that's the point mm -hmm. the, um uh, but if they won't come on camera um i think what susie said just then by adding that word yet i can't see you yet sets the expectation i really like that sets the expectation that you're, that they're gonna have to switch their camera on and be present at the meeting. I really like that. In fact, Susie, I'm just telling everyone I'm gonna steal that. Yeah, it's a good one to steal. I think we're gonna see that happening quite a bit on calls. Uh, Keith, you make a great point though. If somebody is not willing to necessarily give you the time or get on video, I think one of the things that we see from the just state of sales and some of the reports that come out is, Reps spend a lot of time on non-winnable deals. And these signals can be the signals that actually flag, this is a winnable deal, double down on it, let's go. Or maybe we're not going to get this one, move on, right? And, and I think those, those signals of attention and, and engagement are critical, both at the forecast level and, he, and, and larger up in the organization or further up in the organization, but also for that rep to know where they should focus end of quarter, end of, end of year for, for hitting their number. 
So some good, good leading indicators on that side as well. Now, for both of you, I'm going to pose this question. If you had one chapter in this book that you thought this is a must-read chapter or must-read topic, I'm putting you on the spot for sellers. What would be that topic? What would be that topic? What would be the one chapter of the book or the one part of the book that you think, okay, every B2B seller needs to read this? Uh, I think it's when things go wrong. When Tell things me more. Go wrong. Okay, managing the downside, in other words. Mm -hmm. um, there are three things. I think there's three things that can really upset any presentation. Um, and uh, uh, that's um, anim animals. You cannot win. You could be the president of the United States. You're not going to win against a puppy or a kitty cat. You're just not. Um, <laughs> young young children will always steal the show. And uh, technology. Now, te technology is is just so far out out of our control. And now, especially since uh, lockdown, we've we've got to the point whereby Wi-Fi is almost a human right as important as water, running water or electricity. Um, I have to say, not, not all the hardware manufacturers have, have got that figured out uh, just yet. But um, so managing the downside. So to get to your point, uh, Tim, is that if uh, um, so the science has shown, psychology has shown that actually it's the audio which is more important to the continuity of the meeting or the conversation than the video. Wow. And, um, uh, okay, well, I'll tell you what I'll tell you. Can I do a quick, uh, a quick experiment just now? Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so if I lose my, uh, my audio, um, There you go. We've got no idea what he's saying, have we? We just lost just you. Uh, I saw a lot of commotion, a lot of movement. <laughs> what about but... now? Am I back on now? I think I'm back on now. Yeah. No audio. You're back on audio now, but I can take you off right now, Keith. No, that's okay. Uh, oh, look right, at that. You've got go. the control. So, <laughs> so, um... so for the purpose of everybody listening, Keith is now spouting lots of knowledge and we can't hear anything he's saying. Yeah, some would say uh, um, that uh, I sound much better that way. But um, <laughs> if you switch my uh, if you switch my uh, video off, but I, mm -hmm. I keep on talking, but the meeting um, uh, carries on. The, the continuity of the meeting is still there because we've got the audio and uh, and everyone's still engaged. Uh, so if your Wi-Fi is letting you down, uh, switch your camera off until the network stabilizes again, then keep talking and then switch your camera on because the Wi-Fi is 95% of the bandwidth. Uh, or, so the camera is 95% of the uh, bandwidth on Wi-Fi. So that's a top tip right there, right then too. And you'll look like a master communicator by, uh, by doing that. I love that. And I think it's so true because in the moment, you have that big sales pitch, you freak out. Oh, there, things are glitching up. Things are freezing. Just reset, take a deep breath, turn off your video, keep talking. Life will be good. Stay calm, right? Yeah. <laughs> keep good calm. For all of ourselves. Yeah. There we go. Susie, what about you? What's one chapter of this book or one section that you just feel like every B2B seller needs to read, needs to, to study up on or can help them out? So for me, it'll be chapter four, which is all around the virtual meeting itself. So it's the practicalities of it. And it's not just that we've, we've skipped over the tech check and making sure that you've got everything set up right. And it's really, you're in the meeting. What do you do now to be effective? And it covers everything from re removing distractions and making sure you're focused all the way through to what we talked at the beginning of this, this podcast, which was keeping audience attention tips and tricks as to how you can um, keep them involved in the meeting and do those temperature checks as to whether they're still with you or not. Because you're absolutely right. It was funny. You just said about um, the number of opportunities that people have got and 
perhaps some reps spend too long on a lost opportunity before they'll admit it. I was just reading, and I, I was trying to get the research up whilst, whilst you were talking, but I was just reading a, a stat that said that on average, a pipeline is inflated by 19% when it comes to opportunity management in CRMs um, because of that gut feel. Oh, yeah, we were a nice person. Yeah, we had a good chat. You know, then they go into the CRM as an opportunity um, mm -hmm. uh, and then they're in. Um, but that's a completely different topic. That's not for today. But I just wanted to say I agree with you. And so if you can have that frank, uh, upfront conversation at the beginning, that can really help. Um, so I think that the chapter four about the virtual meeting is is the one. If you want to just go straight to it, that's the chapter to go to uh, first. Um, but it's written as a helpful how-to guide. That's what Book Boone, the publishers, asked us for. They didn't want lots of blah, blah. They wanted a short and precise book to really give you top tips. So that's what we've got and done. I, I love it because I think that's where sellers constantly are looking at okay, I don't need the strategy. I don't need all the thought process behind it. Just give me the tactics to make me better right here, right now. Exactly right. Well, I, I've loved it. I think it's a great read for almost anybody who's selling in either a virtual or a hybrid. Gosh, that is pretty much everybody these days. I think even when we're in the office, most of our meetings have some component of somebody on a video call somewhere. So we can all be better at this. Let's now, after kind of listening and learning from you, take me back a little bit. Susie, Keith, you both have a background in sales and sales coaching, sales management and leadership, both, I'm sure, front lines in, in selling products, selling ideas, and in managing teams. Tell us a little bit about your backgrounds and what spurred this to be the book, besides a publisher saying, hey, timely and right, right place, right time. What interested you both in this journey? Because there's a lot of work and, and effort that goes in doing the research and pulling this all together. There absolutely is. And both Keith and I can uh, confirm that um, writing a book is, well, for us, it was a lot more work than we anticipated. So I'm very glad I did it with Keith uh, because I'm not sure I would have it finished if I'd done it on my own. So absolutely. Um I, I think I, I'll, I'll talk for me, but I'm pretty confident I'm talking for Keith as well, is we're both passionate or I'm passionate about helping people. I want people to progress in their sales careers. Uh, as you quite rightly identified, I've gone through the sales journey myself to varying successes. Sometimes I've had sales roles that I didn't do very well. Other times I've done roles that I did really well. Um, and what I realized along that journey was um, what I'm really, really keen to do is to help people achieve their goals. Um, at some point, my achievement of KPIs and the, and the bonus and things like that became less important. And actually, it was seeing that progress of my team members or, or uh, later on in life when I was managing teams, those, those yeah, the, team pe the people in the team who, who were progressing through their careers in their early years. And so I realized that um, what I wanted to do was help. And so if this book, and again, I'm sure I'm talking for Keith here as well, if this book can help one or two people just get further on in a conversation when it comes to uh, the selling uh, process, taking a prospect into a, an opportunity, for example, then, then I feel like job done. Um, that, that's kind of my passion. I just want to help people progress because sales is not a dirty word. Sales is an honorable profession and uh, the people who do it right are those that want to help somebody else make a decision, not push them into making a decision. So, yeah, that's kind of a little bit about the background of what I realized along the years. Um, I feel like that was a very long answer for a short question. So I apologize, there, Tim. No, I, I thought it was it was great. And I think there's a golden thread that I've seen on this podcast, which is the true leaders in sales really do see it as an act of service. And it's fascinating in a time, and, and Keith, I want to get your background on this too, but fascinating in a time when, you know, I look at millennials, I look at the generations coming up and they want a repless, sellerless purchase. They want to just go on, not talk to anybody and, and buy something. And I can understand that in many ways, right? We've all gotten accustomed to that in our, in our B2C lives and in our, in our daily lives. But the other flip of that coin is those same people are having higher levels of buyer remorse and buyer regret. 
And did I buy the right tool? Did I make the wrong choice? Which in a B2B environment could not only mean missing that quarter or that year's number, but it could also mean your team or yourself being in a bad spot at that company, right? So there's a lot riding on these decisions. And I'll just leave that comment because I think truly both Keith, Susie, both of you and many that I've talked to, those that approach this from the idea of true service seem to really be elevating the sales profession as a whole. I love to see that. That's what this podcast is all about. So Keith, I do want to get back to you on this though. Your background, what got you to the point of writing this book and, and kind of all of those, those past experiences, what was the motivating factor for you? Yeah, um, I'm really glad Susie answered first because it's uh, just allowed me to reflect a little bit on that. Um, there is something about, you know, that 30, you know, I've been at this a long time, 35 years, which is older yeah. than most of my clients, actually. <laughs> so uh, um, uh, so there, there, there is that. I, I did this presentation that, uh, in fact, uh, Susie knows Aston Business School pretty good because I think you did your uh, MBA there. If I'm That's very, right. So um, I, I did this uh, lecture. It was on a marketing course, actually, but there was uh, um, I gave a – um, it wasn't really a lecture. It was a presentation, an interactive one, much like we're kind of doing just now. And I played a, a sketch from a, a TV series and I broke it down into 10 second segments. And I, I just kind of, uh, I just talked to the audience. They asked questions, all sorts of things about, and if you want to enjoy a career in sales, these are the kinds of skills you're going to need. Uh, to be looking at. And the program was Peaky Blinders. I, I, I know they do scream uh -huh. in the States. Yep. So there's a particular scene there. And do you know something? And I, and I did it, and I, I got a bit of feedback in the room, and it was all very nice, polite applause. And that was uh, in 2018. And I got a call mid-2020 from this guy called Christian, who said, uh, uh, phoned, phoned me up out of the blue. He said, I don't know if you remember me. He said, but uh, took me back to that time. He said, he said, as a result of, you know, that sort of presentation, that just talk that you gave at Aston, he said, I decided to graduate and, and go into the world of sales. And he said, I've just won my first award. And I thought, it's amazing. Wow. That's, I didn't even get paid for that. Um, <laughs> uh, but what, what a thrill that was yeah. to get a call to get a call like that and so um that kind of actually that made me feel good about myself and i don't apologize for that but it yeah. sounds a little selfish but it gave me the confidence actually something i have struggled with throughout my career um that actually maybe maybe i can do some good things here uh, and that's the, i wouldn't have written a book on my own because that is a real um that, that's a heavy lifting thing so i'm really pleased that susie again um highly complimentary um uh that got, got me involved with that and now that i've been through that process that thought process i feel encouraged about you know putting other material together as well it won't be james joyce though or war and peace or anything like that so i firmly believe you know, 10,000 words are much better than 100,000 these days because of the attention span. So, um, yeah, that's the direction I want to move in. So thank you, Susie. I love it. And, and both both stories of, of service and helping support others. But truly, I think this book at this time, more than ever, it, it, it's so timely in, okay, we've gotten through the the shock of all being on video. But we really do know that this is not going to go away. And it's a skill set that the next generation is going to have to have. And the current generation even is going to have to have to really succeed in their roles. So you're both doing a lot to help lift the org lift the uh, sales uh, and, and that whole role as, as it sits in B2B, the virtual sales challenges that we all face. Um, real quick, where can people, where can our listeners connect with you? Where can they find the book and, uh, and how, can, how can they uh, interact if they've got more questions or if they've read the book or are looking at it and going, wow, Susie, Keith, I love what you wrote here. Tell me more. 
So you can get the book on bookboon.com, which is book and then B-O-O-N.com. Um, and uh, you can purchase it or you can download it for free if you do a 30-day trial. Um, so that's how you can get hold of the book. Um, if you want to reach out to me or Keith, I think I can speak for both of us. We hang out a lot on LinkedIn. So that's probably the best place to find both of us. Um, I'll give you my name and uh, company, which is I'm Susie Matheson, and you can find me at The Small Stuff, and I'm a training a sales training company based in Germany. Keith? Yeah, um, so I'm Keith Rosell. That's R-O-Z, well, well, if you're in the United Kingdom, Z, uh, uh, E-L-L-E, and uh, B2B Sales. Search for me on LinkedIn. You'll find me there, and I'd love to, uh, I'd love to connect and, uh, and chat. Perfect. Well, I will make sure this also goes in the show notes for all of our listeners and those watching on video. I hope you got some of our sections around the funny things that you can do to maybe pull people back and keep them engaged and get to see this live. Um, thank you both so much for joining me on this episode. It has been just a great conversation and I have loved the book. It is a must read for sales teams. And so get out there, get this book for your sales teams and don't overlook the fact that selling over virtual is a different game. It takes different skills. And until next time, keep selling and uh, the best of success to you both. And uh, to all of our listeners, thank you again for listening to another episode. We'll see you next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.